Welcome to Whole and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves, featuring conversations with special guests on topics related but not limited to burnout, mindset, fulfillment, transitions, wellness, and so much more. I am your host, Jessica Locke, Astrala Yoga Guide and Holistic Wellness Coach. And this podcast is not about telling you what to do. I believe we all have the answers we need within. This podcast is here to inspire you, help you find clarity, and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. And of course, we'll be sharing tools and strategies from our guests to embrace your inner wisdom and live unleashed. Ready to dive in? I am so excited for today's guest. Dan is a dear friend of mine. We met in a previous life while studying advertising at OCAT University and became instant friends. Even though we both deviated from that career, we've learned so much and reflect on the power of knowing what we don't want. Dan is a Korean-Canadian art therapist practicing on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, as known as Vancouver. She works with women of color living in Canada to navigate what their identity means to them through art making. She strives to bridge interpersonal, cultural, and social gaps through the expression of art. She is currently in Vancouver with her husband and a rescue dog for the past five years. She loves a good noodle soup and plans to drink many London fogs through the upcoming winter weather. In today's episode, we talked about Diane's journey in fully embracing her name and identity, how her experiences from moving around a lot impacted her sense of self and belonging, how she realized she wasn't aligned to the career she graduated from, the comparison game that happens with social media and how it can echo our insecurities, how she discovered art therapy and in the process find her purpose and healing, and how she's coming home to herself. Let's dive in. Are you feeling? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. One thing I've always wanted to ask, the first time we met, you introduced yourself as, I think, Dayun, and you told me to call you D. So I've been calling you D for the longest time. I'm like, how do I pronounce your name, your Korean name? Yeah, it's, it's actually Da In. Da In. Yeah, Da In. That's, that's perfect. Yeah. And yeah, I have this like weird history with my name. And <laughs> it's still so weird to like introduce myself as Da In because I'm so used to like telling people, oh, just call me DE, just call me DE. But the reason why I started introducing myself as like DE to people was because people couldn't pronounce, or I always assumed that people can't pronounce my Korean name, Da In. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, my name's Da In. And they're like, what? Like, Da what? And then so <laughs> I think a lot of that just became me feeling frustrated so I'm like okay I'm just gonna go with something easy and then I just went with DE and it just stuck with me I think yeah like ever since like all my Korean friends obviously call me Da En but um like ever since I was like like in middle high school like I always went by DE and so it just stuck with me and then now I'm just trying to be more intentional to like actually use my name because you know I'm just yeah, trying to really connect with my sense of identity and like really trying to unpack like why I'm feeling that way about my name and all this kind of stuff. So it's been coming up for me quite a lot. So now I'm being more intentional and like, okay, you can call me DE. I, I seriously don't mind, but you can always call me Dutton too. So yeah, yeah I want to call you though. <laughs> as long yeah. as like you let me know if I'm butchering it or no, you know. No. Yeah. It's okay. I'm glad. I'm glad you've shared that because I as I was like, you know, thinking about your questions to ask, I'm like, I've always written and spell out your name, but I've never said it because I've called you D, which yeah. is, you know, affectionate. But I'm like, I'm curious as to how it sounds. What yeah. about your I guess your family, your husband, does he call you by your name? Yeah, he calls me, yeah, he calls me Da'en. Um, yeah, I don't think he even knows that I go by DE, actually. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, now that I think about it. Um, yeah, I think um, he, well, maybe, yeah, I'm pretty sure he knows, like, my friends refer me as DE, or some of them do, but, yeah, he's always called me Da'en, so I guess also because he's Korean, too, he's just comfortable with Korean names. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's just uh, how I've been introducing myself. 
Yeah. yeah. Do you find it now that you're, I guess you're embracing that part of you, is it easier for people to pronounce it because you feel more open to it? Yeah. And you know what? I think the other part of it too is like before I was so shy about correcting people or like saying like, actually, that's not how you say it. And I would just like sit back and just like not say anything or just be like, oh yeah, I'd like just call me DE. Like even if they try to pronounce my full name, I'm just like, it's just DE is fine or whatever. And I try to brush it off. Um, but yeah, now that I'm trying to embrace it, I am more assertive and a little bit more vocal about, okay, this is how you pronounce it. And some people ask me like, oh, like, how do you, like, how do you properly pronounce it? Right. Because like in Korean, it's actually like, it's actually much more softer. So yeah. So then I, I almost feel like I give them like the English version of like how to say my Korean name. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, like I, I, it's still very new to me. And like, I think I'm still like trying to get used to calling myself Tan because it's like, yeah, it's, it's, DE has been such a, like a, I almost feel like a character for me. So yeah, it's, it's still very, very new, I think. Oh, yeah. well, I'm glad that I can start calling you that now. Done. Yeah. <laughs> done, <laughs> done. Done. It's the EU that's like really complicated. It's like not a, like, it's not like the, it's the two vowels, like in English yeah. language, like it doesn't really happen a lot. But um, yeah, in Korean, if you spell it out, it's like un, and that's mm-hmm. a little bit harder done. to say. But yeah, da un. Oh, well, thank you for like telling me because I think yeah. it's so important to learn to pronounce people's names yeah. more than ever. <laughs> just in yeah. general, it's a sign of respect. And I know how I feel sometimes about correcting people. Like I've been called Jennifer or like, yeah. like a lot of other names and I'm just like, oh, it's, it's fine. Usually it's okay. But then I'm like, if I want to show up in the world, sometimes maybe it's, it's good to be more assertive. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think it takes practice too. Because I, I just, I still remember feeling super uncomfortable being like, actually, that's not how you say my name. And like, just feeling like really uneasy with that. But yeah. now I'm like, okay, like I want to be more intentional and I just want to be really authentic. So if I want to be authentic, then I have to embrace my name and I have to own it. And yes. it's my name. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and it's beautiful. <laughs> we just have to learn to it because sometimes yeah. people are not familiar, but yes, yeah, embrace yeah. all of it. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's my name. (laughs) So, a little bit of background. I know you moved a lot when you were growing up. Can you tell me a little bit more about it? Yeah. um, So, my parents are both Korean, and I was born in Seoul, South Korea. And when I, I think I was two years old, my parents decided to move to Malaysia. Um, because my dad's work and everything. So um, yeah, I moved to Malaysia when I was two years old and I lived there until I was probably like uh, 16, 17, I guess. Um, So I completed 11th grade and I had one year left of high school and I'm like, I'm going to be graduating. But my parents were like, nope, we're we're moving to Canada. (laughs) I'm like, what? Yeah, so... Yeah, from there, I moved to Canada. I immigrated with my family. And then within Canada, we lived in different provinces. So I was in Ontario for a while, then in Alberta. And now I'm in BC. But even in between moving um, like prov- different provinces in Canada, I was also living in Indonesia for a while. I actually moved back and stayed in Malaysia for a while. So it was just a lot of going back and forth between Southeast Asia and Canada. So yeah, there was a lot of transition for me. Was it shocking to spend like 14 years? No, how's my math? 15, I think. (laughs) 15 years of your life, you know, in Malaysia and then moving to another country, especially when you were about to graduate. Yeah, it was like really difficult for me. I remember by 11th grade, I had a really solid group of friends in Malaysia. And 
I mean, living there almost my whole life, I felt like that was home. And so, mm -hmm. you know, even though it was exciting to think about moving to a different country and having new experiences and meeting new people, like I still felt so comfortable living in Malaysia. And that was such a big part of my identity that it was really hard to just walk away from that. Um, so I think initially I was really excited to move to Canada. And then when we did move here, like it, it later came as like as an aftershock being like, Oh my gosh, like I'm actually here and we're not, this is not just like a family trip or living here now and we're settling here. Um, so yeah, it was a bit of a shock and I think it took a lot of time for me to really like adjust to the new environment. And also because, you know, when you're in high school, your sense of identity is such a big thing and you know, you're trying to figure out who you are as a person and you're just starting to, get into the brink of that so mm -hmm. I think that was just a bit of a shock to yeah me and my identity at that time mm. yeah wow and then eventually we met a couple of years later at OCAD for advertising <laughs> that seems like such a far part of my life I feel like of our life because we've completely deviated from that even though we started there we were so not into the same industry yeah. how was I guess the transition between going to high school and then advertising everything in between well I remember um so for those of you who don't know I've met I met Jess at university in um at OCAD which is a art university in Toronto and yeah, that was a really strange time for me because even in my college university years, I had a lot of transition too. So for first year, I was in Edmonton in Alberta and I just finished my first year. And then my dad, due to his work, we had to move again to Toronto. And so that's when I um, moved my credits over and then started my second year at OCAD where I met you, Jess. Mm -hmm. And so it was just a lot of like, uh, disappointment I guess along the way because now I'm feeling like okay like this is my new environment and this is where I'm gonna settle and then once I'm settled or I feel like I'm just starting to settle I had to transition again and move to a different location or meet a new group of friends or um, just everything was just so different and it was just constant changes um, that was really difficult um, but yeah, I remember I recall um, struggling a lot, not academically. I think I was doing fine with school because it, it almost felt like a, like a constant, like a, it was just something that I could do and had some control over. Whereas like my environment and things that I couldn't control, it was really hard to be like, yeah, this is, this is reality and this is, um, this is what I'm working with. And so I think it took yeah, a lot of time for me to really accept where I'm at and how I'm feeling. And so I think I struggled quite a bit just mentally, emotionally when I was in OCAD. And I mean, I don't know how you saw me when I was in OCAD, but I think just on the outside, I was really good at being like, oh, I'm okay. And I got, I got control over this and I'm fine. But like internally, I was just like, help yeah I was like what I, I saw doing? you as I guess as a happy person who, who was there but I think you were curious I saw you as someone who was curious and not attached to the rules or like yeah. not really obsessed over oh is my grade going to matter as much as this you were just there to experience which for me was refreshing because it for advertising it was a bit competitive and I struggle yeah. to make friends because I also emigrated here during first year of university. And I'm like, I'm here ready to make friends with everyone. Mm. But then everybody had their own friends group and there was cultural differences. And when I met you in second year, you were just open. You were there. You were not there to compete. You were not trying to prove anything. You were just there like as a whole. And I'm just like, oh, I can be her friend. <laughs> we can be friends together. <laughs> I'm so glad I I, <laughs> yeah so I didn't know that it was so hard for you what yeah. how was the transition you know did you have any tools then looking back or how um, did you cope 
I don't know if I had any tools. I mean, I don't want to make it sound super old, but <laughs> social media was not a thing back then. Like, and it was like Instagram was, I, I don't know if we had Instagram, but it was still very, very new. And like, I, I almost feel like people these days, and I know we talked a little bit about this, but like talking about mental health is pretty open and there's a much um, bigger awareness around mental health and talking about mental health and what that's like. And um, I think for me, I was never given those tools or I was never um, told about how important mental health is or what is mental health and how do we take care of our mental health. So um, I don't think that I necessarily had tools, but I think the one support system I had while I was in university was uh, family because I immigrated with my family. So I'm really grateful for that. So I had my parents, I had my brother, even though my brother was going through his own thing, like it just still felt like I had um, something at home Mm -hmm. and just friends like you. And, you know, I have, you know, other friends that I won't mention names, but um, (laughs) we had a really good support system. I think for me personally, just um, being able to like talk to people and yeah. And I think also the other thing was, and didn't really think about this, but it makes sense now was art. Like no matter how much transition I had or whatever it may be, like I felt like art was always my thing. And so even though advertising wasn't much of, you know, visual arts and, a lot of like uh, getting creative with that, but more so like branding. I still felt like I was in touch with this creative artistic side that always kept me going. So I think those were kind of what I had to, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, help me like go through that transition. Mm -hmm. And I remember you talked a little bit about how, was it by second or third year that you realized advertising wasn't what you wanted? Yeah, I was, I think it was after second year, which was technically my first year in advertising because I transferred over. So after one year of advertising, I was like, ooh, I don't know if this is for me. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And I was like, oh no, what do I do? (laughs) And I I remember having somewhat of a conversation with my parents being like, hey, I enrolled into this art school that, you know, I mean, they also gave me a lot of pressure around like how art is not going to like make money and all this kind of stuff. And so I was like, no, like advertising is a really cool uh, field and, you know, I'm going to make lots of money and I'm going to enjoy my process and all of this. But yeah, after second year, I felt it in my gut. I was like, "Mm, not for me, not for me. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And how did that feel on top of everything you were going through? I think, honestly, I think I was just really lost because here I am thinking that, you know, my social setting and just like all that transition of like making friends and, you know, all this move and everything, like I didn't want to focus on that. So I was really looking forward to just like being creative and focusing on my career and all of this. But now I'm feeling like I don't even have that. So I was like feeling pretty lost I think yeah and um yeah I just struggled a lot and I remember some some more creative um courses that I took I really enjoyed um like typography and um just I don't remember which classes but there were a few that was more um on the visual side and I think I really enjoyed those um whereas the more branding advertising copywriting stuff I was like I was checked out I was like "Eh, I could do this but I'm definitely not enjoying myself so yeah it wasn't a really good time for me (laughs) so when you graduated because you know you stuck through you finish the career what was your was there like an intentional thought process that you wanted to try it out or you just knew I had to try something that made more sense for you I think for me, I, I remember feeling really lost because here I am now with a degree because I, yeah, I decided to graduate and just follow through. I was like, I'm already in second year. I'm just going to go through with it and see what comes up for me. I'm just going to be open to opportunities. Um, But I just, 
And I know I tried, I tried to reach out to different agencies and everything, but I guess I didn't try enough for me to feel like I really wanted to do it. And so I'm pretty sure I was doing like a, uh, like a not so great job in trying to even put myself out there in terms of looking for a career. Um, but yeah, in terms of my career and the direction that I wanted to take it, I think I was so lost that I decided to take a break. Like I didn't want to start looking for a job or start doing something new or, you know, study even further in advertising to see, you know, if I just need to gain more skills or whatever it was. So, um, yeah, I remember being really exhausted by the time I graduated and so I decided to take a break. And by then my parents actually moved back or moved to Indonesia. And so I decided to just be with family. You know, family has always been a great support system. And so I decided to go back to where my family was. And so I joined my parents and my brother too. Um, they all were in Indonesia. So I joined them in Indonesia and I stayed there for about four years just trying to take a break and uh, figure things out. And I was doing some freelance stuff on the side, which was a lot of illustration and visual arts, mm -hmm. um, but I wasn't up too much. <laughs> yeah. I was just trying to figure it out. And I was like, I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> was there any external pressure from your parents to nudge you towards any direction or just also feeling a sense of, you should be doing something versus, but I hate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, my parents were feeling pretty frustrated with me because they're like, I thought that once you got a degree, like this is an easier route to, you know, getting a job, especially in advertising. And so they were just really confused and I didn't really have answers for them because I too was basically frustrated with the same thing, being like, I you know, I thought at least like if I stuck through and um, graduated with this degree, then I would have some sort of advertising job, but that wasn't the case. And also I would, I just wasn't happy with the whole process. And so I knew something wasn't clicking for me, like something wasn't sitting right. Um, so yeah, I just remember they were not, they were being really intentional and trying to be mindful about not trying to pressure me. Mm -hmm. But even that in itself was a lot of pressure <laughs> on me. I was yeah. like, oh, they're not saying anything. So it's a lot of pressure. But if they do say something, it's direct pressure. And so, yeah, yeah it was a lot of that. And just looking at my friends, you know, and being like, they have cool careers going and some of them landed really amazing ad agency jobs and some of them went to become graphic designers, you know, some of them were doing photography. Like I just started to see people do different things. And so I think that's when I felt really frustrated and just uh, confused about which direction I was supposed to take my career. Because right. I think that's when social media also picked up from... Mm pretty food pictures you know those all those filter <laughs> pictures to actually they were becoming a reflection like a curated portfolio of people's lives yeah and yeah. you know if their careers were taking off they were either showing that or portraying what they wanted to see so that yeah. definitely added to the noise i can imagine yeah yeah no definitely i think um yeah, by that time, by the time we graduated, social media really started to expand and be, uh, it started to grow. And so I think a lot of people were not only like taking like food photos, but they were using the platform as their portfolio, especially in advertising to be like, this is all the creative stuff I'm doing. Um, this is all the graphic design work that I'm doing. And so it was not only pressure from like direct like friends and family or me feeling that pressure but also looking at that and comparing myself and so yeah that was really difficult because it's a lot of me looking at other people and seeing what i lack um, and not really working with what i do have or maybe trying to focus on myself to see where i can take it and so yeah i think it was a really interesting time with social media too yeah, it's funny because sometimes when we feel out of alignment and I didn't know that term before that, you know, all the times I burnt out, I didn't know I was out of alignment and we would seek for inspiration outside of us mm -hmm. instead of 
starting from women because maybe the women is a bit chaotic or it's a bit confusing so we don't know how to access that mm. and I think seeing what you do now so now you're an art therapist I want to hear a little bit of the journey you know going from that loss trying to figure yourself point to kind of coming full circle with coming back to art and finding yourself in the process yeah 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 so I think after being in Indonesia for a while and not being able to really find me and find my place in the world I um by then I don't know if it's coincidence or destiny or whatever you want to call it, but my brother actually wanted to um, enroll himself into one of the universities here in Vancouver. And so I just, for, for some reason, I thought it was time to go like with him. Like something told me, okay, I can't be here forever. And mind you, I was having the time of my life in Indonesia. Like I made a bunch of friends and we were having so much fun and I still had somewhat of a freelance career. So Mm -hmm. Um, I was really flexible in that way, but I was feeling really lost and kind of miserable inside too, because I just didn't feel a sense of purpose and didn't really feel connected with the work that I was doing. So when my brother said that he was going to move to Vancouver, I've never lived in Vancouver. I only lived, um, I mean, I only visited a few times with my family. I just decided that I'm going to go back to Canada. You know, we have our citizenship here and I'm like I don't know what I'm doing in Indonesia just feeling this lost I might as well try to go find myself in Canada so mm -hmm. yeah something told me I had to go back and so I did and um, yeah my brother and I we lived for uh, a while together and then in that process I by accident somebody told me or mentioned to me about art therapy it was like my mom's friends daughter or something someone um i don't remember who it was but i just accidentally heard about art therapy i don't and think it was an accident but i know what you yeah, mean I, sure <laughs> yeah. accident, but um yeah so i heard about art therapy and i looked into it and it sounded so interesting because i realized i really always wanted to connect with people and that was kind of my drive in terms of making friendships and doing the work I do or whatever it may be, I really enjoyed a sense of community and just connecting with people and psychology. So it was, it was almost like a marriage between art and psychology, which I really loved and didn't know much about art therapy. So I looked up art therapy in Vancouver and um, there's one institute that takes in about 20 students per year. So it's a really tight knit group and decided to enroll myself in and my parents were like are you sure is this another art thing that you're doing <laughs> <laughs> you know another education thing that's gonna be useless or whatever it may be so um I mean I love them you know they mean well and everything yeah. but you know it was just a, again a lot of pressure on my part to be like I don't know what I'm doing but I'm just gonna take a chance and see yeah um so yeah, I went to school for art therapy and then it changed my life. It sounds so dramatic and so cliche, but it changed my life because um, then I was able to really started to understand everything about mental health mm -hmm. and my own mental health and some of the things that I was struggling with. And because it was such a small group of, um, it was such a small cohort, we were all able to really connect with each other on an intimate level and share some really vulnerable, painful things um, that I never had the opportunity to anywhere else. Like even in university, it always felt so competitive and it felt like there was no sense of community. Um, whereas here, it very much felt like a safe space and I really started to understand the theory of art therapy and also um, we had studio time where we made our own art and got to know ourselves better. And so I think it was not only learning about art therapy and what it is, but also learning about ourselves and myself and who I am. So yeah, I was all for it. And it was so intense <laughs> and so dreamy. Like I, I have a cohort friend, um, we still chat about art therapy and our time together when we were in the same cohort, but 
it felt like we were in a different world. Like it felt so safe and um, cozy and comfortable and so much learning and growing. And so I've never experienced that in my life. And so I think by the time I finished that program, I knew this was what I had to do and this was my purpose and this is what I wanted to carry on doing. And so, yeah, it was definitely not an accident. I keep saying an accident and know, know what you mean, but it wasn't an accident. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's how I discovered art therapy. Oh, that's beautiful. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. I know <laughs> it's not an accident, but it was also, you were open to trying things. I think that's what makes you more receptive to it mm. coming through. And I love the fact that even though Canada was a time that it sort of represented a time where your life was completely up level. <laughs> no, not up level. That's not the word. Like, like the rug was pulled under you and mm. you had to adapt to, you know, figure yourself out. And then you left Canada trying to find yourself, but then you came back to Canada, yeah. and, you know, heard about art therapy and, it's just such a beautiful transformation process. And really it feels full circle <laughs> yeah. integrating that art part with you. Yeah, it really is. Cause I used to think that art was like, everyone thinks, you know, when you paint or you draw or you do something creative, I always felt like as a kid, like a lot of people really were not jealous, but they were just really, love that I had that gift or that I was able to use art as an expression and I could I was comfortable with art and art was always part of my life and it was really encouraged at home too um, I have many aunts and they're all uh, they all make art or has had art backgrounds um, my mom plays a piano and so just like creative spirit was always just really encouraged at home which I'm super grateful for but I think just along the way, I lost that sense of like why I'm doing the art and like why it's important to me and what I value about it. And so when I discovered art therapy, I think it all started to click and it all started to make sense for me because in advertising, um, and I'm only speaking from my, my perspective, but it very much felt like um, the the branding of it or the the showing off of products and all this stuff was telling people that they're not good enough it's like oh you're not good enough and so you need this product or you're not beautiful enough and so you need to lose weight and you need this product or like you need to eat this or like you need to use this app or whatever it may be it always felt like you're never enough and so i think i had a lot of resistance to that and i didn't know the language for it or I didn't really understand like what exactly it was that I was so resistant to or why I didn't really connect with the work. Whereas art therapy was really not judgmental. Like it didn't even matter what you paint or what you make or, you know, how you express yourself. And so it was fully about whole acceptance and what that looks like. And I think that's where I was really drawn to. And um, yeah, I don't, I forgot what your question was, Jess, but um, I think I just really found myself through art therapy. And whereas before, I just felt so confused about the purpose of making art mm -hmm. and what that meant for me. Uh, thank you for that. I want to dig a little bit more into um, art therapy. Um, what is an art therapy session? How does an art therapy session look like? Um, so for me, an art therapy session looks like me, the art therapist, and the client. And we have some art materials. And um, usually on the first session, we discuss about some of the boundaries that we're going to put in place and make sure that both of us are feeling safe um, with um, our practice and you know, making sure that we understand that everything is shared between us is confidential. Um, so just having a little talk around that and making sure that the client and the art therapist feel safe. Um, but usually what it entails is some checking in to see how we're feeling and then making some art around that. So if you're having a bad day, if you're having a good day, 
Um, how can we represent that through colors, shapes, textures? Um, what does that look like? What does that feel like to you? And so it's really a way to express your thoughts and emotions. And there's no boundaries with that, right? It's limitless. So you can use whatever art material you're comfortable with or you want to start exploring if it's something new to you. And so I like to see myself as an art therapist as the guide. So I'm not judging your work. I'm not telling you what to do. But, you know, if you are feeling lost or you're not really sure like where to start or how to begin the process, I can give you some prompts or give you some directives. Um, but it's really up to the client to fully express themselves and then also to unpack that by talking about it, by sharing how they're feeling in the process, um, what they're feeling using the art materials that they're using. So, um, yeah, I think it's just really a, a way to express yourself and the art therapist being a guide and a witness to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. What are some benefits um, your clients experience from an art therapy session? I think the best thing about art therapy is that you don't have to talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I know sometimes, you know, we can, like, even for myself, like, when I see my therapist, I'm like, oh my gosh, and then this happened, and blah, blah, blah. like, we're just like word vomiting. And we're like, <laughs> and I just had a bad day. And it's just, I think that's really helpful because you're just venting, right? You're releasing everything out. But sometimes you can do that through just like the use of art and just putting paint on paper or just coloring or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And there's something magical. I don't know what exactly it is, but I like to call it externalizing. So whatever you have inside of you, you're putting it out on paper and getting a perspective and looking at literally looking at visually uh, what you're working with. And so wow. I think it's really amazing because it is almost like looking at a mirror or you're creating art and then you're able to see visually what you're working with and what you're struggling with and then being able to talk about it. And, you know, some people realize that there's parts of them on the paper that they didn't even realize or like, you know, when they're starting to talk about the different colors and textures that they worked with, they're also saying, oh, but I'm just starting to realize that I really don't like this color because it reminds me of whatever, or, you know, some parts of me that I really don't like, or um, some pain that I'm going through. So I think it's, I think it's really great that you're able to put that out on paper and then really have an honest conversation about it. So yeah, you, you can talk, you know, you can talk about it, but you can also make art around it too. So I think it's, it's amazing that you're able to do both in a session. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's almost as if art is the medium through how they process mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. that they're dealing with. And it's such a necessary, I, I feel like art therapy is so necessary for a lot of people and kids and adults because we're judged by our creativity. Like growing up, people might say, stop drawing because, or maybe they tell you your drawing is not as good as your neighbor. So you repress a lot of your creativity. And I've met yeah. a lot of people who say, I'm not creative, but I think we all are. Like mm -hmm. we all have ideas, but we just feel that because it doesn't match a certain standard mm -hmm. of how beautiful art is in quotation, then we don't express themselves. So you're kind of, the guide that allows them to dig into the creativity if they've repressed it or even mm -hmm. if they haven't repressed it to express it in a way that is reflective that is so beautiful and profound yeah, yeah. I'm so yeah. glad you found that yeah and I think honestly I had to experience it for myself in order to know that this stuff works because I think before I was a skeptic too and being like, yeah. what do you mean you can express yourself through art? Because for me, like you said, it's very like, it's a very judgmental thing, you know, like growing up, like, especially when it comes to des design or illustration or something very visual, um, even though it's very subjective and people can read it in whatever way they want, it's also very judgmental too to be like, that's good art, or that's bad art, or this looks beautiful, and that doesn't look beautiful. And so I think, yeah, it's a really nice way for you to just be 
and just mm -hmm. let yourself kind of express in whatever way you want and um, feel safe in doing that. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's a really beautiful way to be honest with yourself. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are, is there, what are some resistance that some people might have going to art therapy? I think the biggest resistance is, you've mentioned this, is I'm not creative. So I'm not an artistic person or I'm not a creative person or it's been so long that I've made anything or drawn anything or, you know, just a lot of self-judgment about feeling like they can't express themselves through art because they're not good enough. And so I think there's a lot of initial resistance with that. Um, and I think another thing is um, people who are not ready to reveal themselves to the self. So, you know, a lot of people, one of the reasons I think why a lot of people are hesitant about going to therapy is because they know exactly how much they're struggling and they know exactly how much baggage and stuff, you know, just a lot of stuff that they hold within that they're just so overwhelmed and worried about what if I unpack all of this and it's just too much and, you know, too painful and it's hard for me to come back from that. And so mm -hmm. I think that's another reason why people are resistant to not only our therapy, but just uh, therapy in general too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how, how do you usually approach that resistance? I mean, I know you can't convince somebody who's not ready to change, but what if somebody comes to you and they're like, I really want to change, but I'm so worried about, you know, this huge list of things. Mm -hmm. Have you had a situation like that? Yeah, I think all my clients, I think, really? yeah, I think, well, they first, the good thing about art therapy is that it's uh, more open and it's more friendly. It's like an easier, it's less intimidating than say talk therapy, I think for a lot of people. Like for me, I am a little self-conscious about the way I speak. And sometimes I'm just like, maybe I'm not pronouncing that word right. You know, just like being an immigrant and still feeling like I'm less than, you know, in, in this world, sometimes I do feel a little bit self-conscious about that. Um, but I think with art, it just feels like, okay, this is a different language and this is a different avenue that I can try to explore myself in. And so I have a lot of clients who sign up because they think it's fun. So mm -hmm. I think that's one thing too, is that, oh, it's making art and talking about my art. So it shouldn't be that bad. Right. So I have a lot of clients doing that, but um, I think in the process, when it comes to um, a challenging area about revealing themselves or talking about themselves on a deeper level, that's when they feel really stuck. Mm -hmm. And so how I help them or how I guide my clients is by um, really being empathetic, right? And just listening to them and seeing why they feel stuck or why they feel this resistance or what's coming up for them that they feel uncomfortable to um, express themselves fully. So it's a lot of just compassion and empathy and just trying to be there to listen and trying not to judge um, their resistance. And um, sometimes I just have directives that, you know, I can, an activity that I can really encourage them to work with. And I think that's helpful because it gives them a structure and something to work around because I think it's overwhelming for anyone, even somebody like yourself or myself who are used to art making to give them a blank sheet of paper and be like, go make art or like do whatever you want. You're yeah. just like, oh my gosh, like, I don't know what to do. Ever? Blank yes. piece of paper can be scary because there's, yeah. I guess we attach so much expectation to yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't want to ruin something so like clean and pristine with, you know, something that we might mess up or whatever. So I think, um, yeah, in, in that case, if the client wants to have some sort of uh, framework, then I can offer them directives and activities that they can really start to work with. And from then it becomes a little bit more of a natural process. But um, yeah, sometimes, I mean, it's natural for anyone to feel stuck in the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've learned so much about art therapy. 
Yeah. I would recommend it to everyone. I think <laughs> schools should have that too. <laughs> it's such an important yeah. part of just processing and expressing yourself. And I like how you integrate both of those. Yeah. A lot of, um, I think a lot of elementary schools and um, actually a lot of high schools too these days. Um, I don't know about in other provinces, but I know in Vancouver, they really trying to um, involve more art therapists into their programs and curriculum. So that's really good um, because I think art class is different because you're being judged and you're being graded for your artwork and there's mm -hmm. um, specific themes that you're working around with. Um, but an art therapist is just like counseling or seeing a therapist. You're there to talk about what's going on with you and being able to just express yourself. So uh, yeah, I'm glad to see that being more integrated into the community. But yeah, I definitely agree. I wish there were more an art therapist for everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially yeah. the no judgment part. So, so important. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. What are some of the services that you are offering? So um, I'm mostly working with individual clients. So one-on-one -on -one sessions, um, usually my sessions are an hour long. Um, and I'm trying to create a program. Um, I'm currently working on it right now where I can really work with clients who um, East Asian and Southeast Asian um, women who really want to learn more about their own identity and trying to um, rediscover themselves um, because that's something that I struggled with myself for a long time and I think it's really important to able to have something for yourself to know that um, you have a lot to offer and that you know you're a valuable person mm -hmm. and so yeah I'm trying to integrate um, some of my anti-oppressive work um, with art therapy and really trying to help um, Asian women with that so uh, yeah, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one art therapy, and I used to do group, but because of COVID, um, I'm trying to plan with that. I'm not too sure what I have in mind, but um, we'll we'll see about the group stuff. Yeah, stay tuned for it. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Can always sign up on her website. I'll share in the information below. But yeah, yeah. where can people find you? Um, you can find me on Instagram. It's d e dot art therapy uh, that's my handle and you can also go to my website at uh, d oh sorry dot in art therapy dot com so that's d a e u n art therapy uh, dot com and yeah i think those are the two platforms that i have right now um, if i decide to expand then i'll share more too perfect yeah. i wanted to wrap this up with I'm thinking of a better way to name it because I name it rapid fire questions, but okay. you will realize that it's kind of deep. So don't feel cool. pressure to answer okay. it right away. <laughs> Working on that branding section. Okay. What's so I'm the answering, best? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So I'm answering You're, as fast as I can. I guess what comes up in your mind, but due to the nature of these questions, I think you can, Take a little bit of time to think about it okay. if you need to. Okay. All right. Yeah. You'll, you'll know when it comes up. <laughs> okay. What's the best compliment you've ever received? Um, that I, that when my clients tell me that they feel safe with me. Mm. A book that's changed your life? A book that's, ooh, so many. Um, the Interpreter um, by Suki Kim. The interpreter. Is There's it a so novel? many, but sorry. Is it a novel? Um, yes, and uh, it's by a Korean American author, and I actually read it a few months ago. And I have so many books that you know, I really could recommend, but I think that one really spoke to me just because of that cultural piece. And so mm -hmm. yeah, I felt really heard and um, really connected with my own identity with that book. So yeah, that's the book. What does coming home to yourself mean? 
See, these are not rapid fire. <laughs> I, I need to I'm change the name. To myself. No, that's okay. That's okay. Um, to coming home to myself means sitting with myself and just being, even though, you know, sometimes it feels uncomfortable being just me or just sitting with myself, um, just being able to be a friend of mine and just being able to support myself in that. Um, so I think that's what it looks like for me. Yeah. What are some tools that you use when you're feeling stuck, disconnected from yourself? I think asking for support, which mm. has been really difficult for me, I realize. You know, I am so good at offering support and like, you know, giving the help to other people and being of service. But I think me asking for support, I still really struggle with. And so I'm really trying to put that in practice. And so, yeah, asking for support for myself. How does it feel now that you're putting it more in practice? Does it become slightly easier each time? Yeah, definitely. I think... Um, I don't know why, but there's just so much resistance. And I mean, I know exactly why, but <laughs> there's a lot of resistance um, with just asking for help and asking for support and trying to reach out to people and, uh, you know, asking for that sense of community and belonging. Um, so I think the more I do it, the easier it becomes. And the more I realize that, you know, there are people who are always willing to support and there are people always willing to listen. So. Um, it does become easier, you know, with more practice. Yeah, I feel like we can have an entire, another podcast episode about just asking for support because that's such a huge one that I'm, I'm still learning, but it's so hard. I don't know yeah. if it's because of the way we were raised or becoming a woman. I think it's a mix of all those things where mm -hmm. asking for support is harder than just burning out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what it mm -hmm. felt like before. Yeah. yeah, that's a big yeah. one. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Um, what would you like more of? What would I like more of? People's stories. Mm -hmm. So I would, I'm such a sucker for people's stories and just people talking about themselves. There's just, just something so attractive to me about that. And so if people could share more, be more vulnerable, be more open to sharing about, you know, themselves, because I think we're all here to listen and we all want to hear more. So I just love the different storytelling aspects of people and um, the willingness to do that. So people's stories are definitely something I want to have more of. Uh, yes, that's yeah. why this podcast is here yeah. too. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> it's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, an advice for younger self? Relax. <laughs> <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> I think. I think honestly, I think I was just. It's just so funny, you know, like when we're stressing about something and then like a year later, you look back and you're just like, seriously, that, that's what, what I was stressing about. And then the year after that, like if you look back again of the two years or three years or whatever, you're just like, why was I struggling with that? Like <laughs> I have bigger, better problems now. So I think, yeah, when we're younger, just it's okay like it's okay if you think you're making the wrong decisions or if you're not sure what your career is going to be or who you're going to turn out to be or what kind of person you are or just you know all these different things that build anxiety I think I would just tell myself relax just take it. <laughs> don't figure it out don't be more yeah. problems for you in the future yeah. more challenges exactly it's gonna get worse so just yeah. enjoy the ride <laughs> <laughs> Not to be, be pessimistic. Cool. Yeah. I know. An optimist or pessimist is going to be worse. Might as well enjoy yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love that. Mm -hmm. And that's about it. I Ooh, thank yay. you. Peace for my 
non rapid fire questions. If you have a suggestion for a better title, please let me know. <laughs> no, I like them. I like them. It makes you. It also makes you think fast about such deep questions, and uh, keeps you on your toes. So I like it actually. Um, yes. Don't change I, it. <laughs> I know. I can. I I can overthink a lot on mm. certain things so that's why i'm like rapid fire but then i don't want to put people in the spot where they're like oh, oh, i can't think yeah. of anything i like panic. all the books <laughs> yeah like don't panic just whatever comes out of your mind mm. yeah oh uh, thank you so much for joining me Dawn. thank you done Dawn. yeah Dawn. yeah I'm, i'll be better at it <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for listening to the whole and unleashed podcast what was your takeaway from today's conversation let me know in the comments or review on iTunes. I would love to hear from you. Subscribe to get new episodes each week and visit wholeandunleashed.com for more information.